Since trying to soft reboot the franchise with Prometheus, the Alien movies have had trouble sticking to a vision. Does this second course correction of the rebooted series provide a foundation for the future, or is it playing it too safe by being stuck in the past? Some of both, I think. I'm Peter Franson from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions. The IMDb synopsis for Alien Romulus reads, while scavenging the deep depths no, deep ends, excuse me, of a derelict space station, a group of young space colonists come face to face with the most terrifying life form in the universe. Of course, we all know what the most terrifying life form in the universe is, right? Uh, this movie takes things back to the working class and that focus, like the truck, the space truckers of the first movie, um, compared to like the company employees and like the scientists and stuff of uh, Prometheus and, and Covenant. Um, these are miners working for a company, the company, Wayland yutani and they're being treated terribly, as you would guess if you're familiar with the company and the franchise. They're wanting a better life, and these characters are hoping that illegal scavenging will get it for them. Uh, this setup doesn't endear me to the characters anymore, though. Even with them being underdogs, it doesn't doesn't quite endear me to them like maybe they thought it would. The ensemble is also all, I think, in their 20s which also feels narrow and a bit kind of pandering to a younger crowd compared to the broader range of ages that we saw in the ensemble casts of previous movies. Sympathy is also chiefly attempted, I think, to be focused on an android whom we're supposed to see perhaps as a person and perhaps see them as being mistreated, but a later turn showcases to me exactly why they should not be considered a person. Uh, this brings some welcome complexity in terms of how I'm thinking and feeling about this character, but uh, the focus they gave to trying to garner sympathy for him was time they could have given to helping me care about human characters. And I think at the end of the day, I wanted a little bit more time spent on that. The first hour is largely character introductions and establishing motives, all good, important things that I want in a movie. And it progresses into some familiar beats that I think you'd expect in an alien movie if you're familiar with the franchise. Uh, while there were some slight pivots conceptually about the alien in those first 60 minutes, this creature has been featured in seven movies now. Part of what makes movie monsters interesting and horrifying to me is what you slowly learn about them from a starting point of zero knowledge. You know, it, it's the difference between thinking, what in the world might happen to, oh, I know what's going to happen. You know, the, oh, I've seen what the alien does. He's going to do that. Oh, this person has it coming. They don't know what's going to happen to him, but I know what's going to happen. I don't like that feeling. I want to be along with the person wondering, what is wrong with my body? What is this thing I'm experiencing? What is going to happen next? And the tension that comes from that, and then the shocking moments that show you from out of left field what is possible with this creature. Um, and that fear of the unknown and wondering what's going to happen is so valuable to me in creature features. Uh, but this creature is so known at this point that the first half of the movie, though often given because of the directing style, given weight, given the stakes that I would want many times, still was not really pulling me in like I wanted because of my familiarity with the creature. Now, the second half of the movie, it's about a two-hour movie, the second half of the movie starts making some conceptual turns into uncharted territory, both revealing new things about this alien we're so familiar with and introducing new creature concepts altogether, though stopping short, I think, of jumping the shark like I think Alien Resurrection did in its climax with the new concept, the new spin on things that it introduced there. I was like, this is weird. This doesn't feel like an alien movie. I'm not scared of this. It's I'm, I'm weirdly, yeah, I don't need to talk about the climax of Resurrection. <laughs> anyway, I think they avoided the problems that I was feeling at the end of Resurrection with the turns that they took, the new concepts they introduced here. But I was wondering, because it has some things in common with where they went with Resurrection, I was like, oh, oh, are they going to do something that I'm not going to like again? But no, I was like, oh no, I... I like this. This is uh, this is weird and creepy. And there are uh, some great sequences also dealing with new problems posed by the same familiar alien um, that were, I thought, impressive for their novelty. That I was like, oh, yeah, I never thought about this kind of scenario possibly happening. And so it was cool what they were still able to extract <laughs> from being up against this very familiar creature. Uh, and the directing style used... Um, 
used shadows a lot in the, the lighting to leave some details to the imagination in, I thought, a really effective way. It had a little bit of James Cameron's Aliens movie DNA in terms of the pivot toward action, but just a little bit of that. It mostly played overall like a sci-fi horror movie that leaned into true terror, um, and that was valuable to me. The, the second half really made the whole thing well worth my watching of it, and well worth eventually adding it to my collection, which I certainly plan to do. I just wish it wouldn't have taken an hour to really kick into that gear and make me feel that way. Uh, now, without spoiling anything, I'll mention connections to the past and future of the franchise, um, and I'll talk around you know particular details to not spoil anything. First, the past. This movie takes place around 2042, and that's between Alien and Aliens. And it also takes place, if you can track with me here, almost 40 years after Alien Covenant, because both Prometheus and Covenant took place before Alien, the first Alien movie. Um, and so this one's almost 40 years after Alien Covenant, but still before Aliens. Um, Alien Covenant 2104. So anyway, 40 years later in the timeline, is there any connective tissue to Prometheus or Covenant without, again, giving any spoilers? Yes, partially in concept, um, I mean, I think there's actually a significant concept that's carried over from Prometheus. And then very briefly in dialogue, is there a mention that clearly connects it? So it does, I think, fit into, unless there's some finer details I'm missing, it does fit into the continuity. I, there's an interview on IGN with the director that says that the, that was the intent, was that it not be contradicting anything else going on in the franchise. Uh, so I feel like it does sit within the, the franchise very well. Um, but it could have been so much more strongly connected to Covenant um, and Prometheus. I mean, certainly could have been more connected to Covenant. It was uh, barely connected to Covenant, in my opinion. Um, the first Alien movie is drawn from much more, and in a way that felt forced and unnecessary and not as logical. Uh, it felt like a creative choice that perhaps was driven by people, them thinking, well, people didn't turn out for Prometheus and Covenant. Let's just reference the one that they know, you know. Um, but I'm looking at a key character, and I'm thinking, this character should be the android David from Prometheus and Covenant. Why is this not David? It seems very possible to me that the character I'm thinking of actually was David in an earlier draft of the script that maybe was converted to this alternative choice at some point, perhaps because Michael Fassbender was not interested or available. That's just kind of a speculation on my part, but it would make sense of how this character is used and what they're motivated by and stuff. The motives would have to change a little bit, but anyway. Um, some ideas from Prometheus are very present and central, I think, to the second half. But the ending of Covenant is not provided any advancement here or resolution certainly here that I could spot in this movie and uh, I still think that's a thread that they could pick up and I, I, I wish they would in the next Alien movie just even just a reference saying this is what happened this is the outcome of you know what where they were headed at the end of Covenant you know but we didn't get that in this one um, unfortunate connections to the past show up as recycled quotations. Um, I know audiences must like these because Hollywood keeps writing them in. And when there was one of them, someone, you know, a row down to the right for me kind of chuckled at it. I was like, oh, sir, <laughs> please don't feed the beast. <laughs> and, you know, I liked a, a couple of those types of recycled quotations once upon a time. But they've been doing them for so long, so overdone. Now, when I hear them in movies, I just shake my head as I feel like I'm, I'm trying to be manipulated into liking what's in front of me by an appeal to something I liked years ago, instead of them doing something striking and new in this moment that would be worth quoting later on, you know? Um, there are also story moments that feel like echoes of past Alien movies in a way that felt... A little uncreative, if not tired. Um, I, I'm not sure why movies do that. They like follow a similar structure or have like this certain type of thing happen in this certain type of place, environment in the movie or time in the story or whatever. It just feels like, ugh, why, why are we doing this again? Um, yeah, anyway. As for where the future of the franchise could go from Romulus as a, as a starting point... I think the surviving characters of Romulus have as much setup as Ripley had for uh, for more movies at the end of that first Alien movie. 
But like that movie, the survivor's story here also feels complete. Um, and it would be easier, I think, to pivot away from the survivors of Romulus than it was to pivot from the survivors of Prometheus and Covenant. And that might be intentional, them not knowing, okay, we're going to try this again, because clearly, for some reason, they felt like they needed to pivot away from what had come in the last two movies. There's been two pivots. This is the second pivot now. Um, and so they're in a pivoting pattern, and I wonder if they're just playing it safe and saying, let's, let's pretty much wrap up this story, and if people love these survivors, we can make more movies about them, and if they don't, we can easily move on to something else. I would actually, at this point, with this kind of pattern emerging, be pretty happy with future movies that just kept using new characters, a new central protagonist each time, but still advanced the lore of this world, um, which Romulus does, which each of these movies does in some way. Um, I think that is kind of the through line, especially now that Ripley has been for three movies now out of out of the equation. Um, and so I feel like the um, uh, the aliens, the, the the concepts in Prometheus, um, and even Wayland Yutani, all of those things have elements that could be advanced, that could be explored further, um, and at least in the lore or understanding of these things. So. I think that could carry future movies, and I kind of hope it does, because the surviving characters don't really make me feel like, oh, wow, I care about them so much, I want to see them in particular in a, in a new Alien movie. No, not really. I'm fine with a new cast if they go that route. Uh, okay, but as far as the cast goes, I did feel like they were solid. You know, they portrayed panic and stress and tension effectively. Those are the things you have to, the boxes you have to check in your acting in a horror movie. But sadly, I don't feel like a lot more was asked of them compared even to, say, like Prometheus or something. Um, I would love a wider range of emotions in the next one. Um, maybe there are some scenes on the cutting room floor that showed more playful affection or, or other types of emotions, other types of scenes where characters are feeling different types of things. And some of that is on the writing, I think, and in the motivations, maybe not being as complex. I feel like the in Prometheus, David is a really complex character you're constantly trying to read, but like his quote-unquote sister, as it were, also is an interesting character to watch that is flawed but also kind of relatable and there, there's just some interesting things going on in some other alien movies that uh, were absent for me here as far as okay the effects stunts visuals all that kind of stuff really most of it very solid but very happy i felt for the most part in the experience in the world and not taken out of it aliens were both practical and digital and i think they knew when to use which technique uh, the sets all looked great and the lighting kept them feeling ruggedly real by not being afraid of using shadows and keeping a few details obscured here and there but there is a case of to me glaring digital face replacement or replication we might say and when this character speaks the mouth movement in particular was rough uh, again, my eyes seem cursed to pick out this kind of thing, but they certainly were seeing it constantly with this character. It was an effect they seemed inappropriately proud of, given how often the face was well-lit and unobscured, when there was a perfectly reasonable opportunity to cover the face in liquid that could have helped uh, mask the shortcomings of the technology. There's very present and sensible goop that could be on that character's face. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, you gotta you gotta hide that hide the monster as they used to say to in part create mystery, but also to hide the shortcomings of the effects, you know, and leave things to the imagination. And I think that they were not playing to strengths here; they were showcasing the weaknesses of where the tech is at right now in this case. And it took me out of the movie every time they spoke, and they spoke a lot. Um, so that was that particular element was a bummer. All right, themes. Is there anything of moral, philosophical, or spiritual significance going on in the themes of this thing that could trigger some worthwhile thought or conversation? Um, you know, sometimes in horror movies, there's some implied morality being suggested based on who survives and who doesn't. That doesn't seem to be a device here. I suppose there's the usual corporations are bad stuff. But I mean, in this franchise, that's just lore at this point. It doesn't feel like it's a theme or a message they're trying to put out there. Uh, the sympathy for the AI character is inconsistent because of a turn that is taken. So maybe there was something intended there about like um, certain types of family relationships or something else, but the AI muddies whatever message might be there. So I, I don't think there's anything that really strikes me as a springboard for meaningful thought about real world issues in uh, Alien Romulus. All right, no idea what your tastes are in movies, but if I were time traveler, I'd go back in time and say, Pater, 
wait and buy. You're definitely going to like it enough to want to watch it again and to own it, uh, but it's not going to knock your socks off, so why not just wait and pay for it the one time. Uh, this one is rated R for bloody, violent content and language, and those are all of my thoughts, for now at least, uh, about Alien Romulus. As always, I'd love to get your thoughts and reactions in the comments below. Please like, share, subscribe, click that bell to stay connected. I want to thank the Spirit Blade Insiders for making this review possible. You can get info about the benefits of joining over at patreon.com slash Productions. Then, I hope you'll check out our podcast and stay connected to all kinds of CGC content over at Christian Geek geekcentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. For more chat about geek entertainment, answers to your questions, and news from the wider world of Christian geekery, get the Christian Geek Central podcast today on iTunes and other podcast services.